Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Moving day. I don't think anyone looks forward to packing up all their possessions and moving from one home to another. Now, we have some friends, and they were in the midst of moving and making those preparations, and then it happened. Moving day. And the father tells me about how he woke up early, about 5.15, was planning on getting up at 8, and he rolled over and looked at that clock, 5.15, and he just had dread, because he knew what was coming. And he said he had just turned over when his four-year-old boy came into his parents' bedroom, all excited. Now, their son, I mean, he's all boy, and he's alive. You, he comes into a room, you know he's alive. And he burst open this door and said, what's the matter? It's moving day, let's get up. And the father looked at that son and saw such a difference between the excitement, the enthusiasm, the desire to get started because he was happy about this new home. But his father, he was thinking about this difficult transition, packing everything up, moving it, unpacking. He was thinking about the process and not the end. Now, I think that silly example really describes a lot of us. Because there is coming a time called moving day. That is the end times. And so often we look at these things, and yes, they're difficult. Yes, it's full of persecution. Yes, it is times of trouble. But in the end, and this is why Messiah speaks of them as birth pains. Birth pains have a purpose. That in the end, a child's going to be born. There is a purpose. There is an objective. And therefore, if we are truly excited about the purpose of God to establish His kingdom, then we are going to be interested in discerning, understanding, and being ready for those last days. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to this final chapter in the book of Joel. Now, when we look here, we need to remember something. That the last days are not some neatly packaged up event. That the enemy's coming, there's going to be one war, we're going to be victorious, and then the kingdom. No, it's a lot messier than that. Remember what Messiah said. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Wars in the plural. I think we forget that sometimes. There are going to be numerous wars. They are going to happen in various places. There is going to be natural disasters. There is going to be all types of cosmic events that bring about great suffering, great hardships, numerous deaths, great persecution. But in the end, they all have a purpose to bring the greatest number of people into the kingdom of God. We may not see it when we hear about these events, but they all have that purpose, to bring the greatest number of individuals, both Jews and Gentiles, into a kingdom reality. Look at verse 1. For behold, the days are coming. And let me add, and they are near. If you are a good student of prophecy, you will be aware that events have already begun. Now, we're not in those last seven years, but events are moving. And we need to remember what, what Paul said. I've shared this with you before. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 
and verse 1. He says, concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, speaking to believers, concerning the times and the seasons, you have no need that I write to you. Why would he say that? Because this information, the vast majority, has already been written in the prophets. And when we look at this short prophecy of just 73 verses, it contains so much information in regard to what's going to happen. So he says here, For behold, the days are coming. Time, seasons, two distinct period that bring about what we're speaking of to see. For in that time, I will do something. Now, it's amazing to me how many well-known and respected Bible teachers are saying, how many seminaries, for example, A very good one is Dallas Theological Seminary. And more and more within the faculty, they are coming into a position of theology that that minimizes Israel, that places no significance anymore on that land. But when we look today, we find that, that God is zealous for the land. And when we look at the scripture, pay very close attention, he's going to do something. It says in verse 1, at that time, I will bring back the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. I will gather all the nations. So he's going to do two things. He is going to bring back the Jewish people to the land. Is that happening? It is happening in a mighty way today. It began some time ago, at least 70 years ago, and even before that, but it is growing. And here's the thing that's unique. We see people coming, Jewish people returning to the land from a greater number of countries. So this is being fulfilled. In those days, I will restore the captivity, bring them back from the lands where I've scattered them, those of Judah and Jerusalem. And in doing so, notice what's going to happen. Look at verse 2. This coming back to the land, the reestablishing of the nation of Israel is going to bring about war. Realize that. It's going to be a catalyst for conflict. God's aware of that. Notice verse 2. And I will gather a few of the nations. Is that what your Bible says? I will gather all the nations. Every one. Everyone in Asia, Africa, North America, every place. They are going to be gathered. And he says, and I will bring them to a specific valley. Now, we know where that valley is. We call today as it was called 3,000 years ago, and that is the Jezreel Valley. We know that's the place, but here we have a different name, do we not? We have the valley of who? Yehoshaphat. Now, you know what that means. God tells us that this valley, the Jezreel Valley, we need to know first what that means. The word Yezreel in in Hebrew means God will plant. And the context says God is going to plant his people once more in the land of Israel. That is happening in a mighty way. The nations are not going to like that eventually. And God is going to gather all the nations. He is going to bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, which means what? God judges. It is a place of judgment. This valley, Jehoshaphat, is also known by another name, not just Jezreel, but you know the third name? The valley of Megiddo, that is Armageddon. So he's going to bring them to that location, and he says, and I will be judged with them. What does that mean? We're going to understand the nature of God, not just us. Hopefully, we already do. That he's faithful, that he's righteous, that he's holy, and he's truthful. But the world doesn't see it that way. And therefore, when God says, and I will be judged with them there, as he deals with these nations that are rebellious and boastful and stand in opposition to his purposes, his faithfulness to the children of Jacob, 
He is going to be judged, meaning he is going to be manifested as he judges those people there. And he says, they will see how I behave concerning my inheritance, Israel. Now, I, I put a circle around that. God is speaking, and he says concerning this people and this land, he says, this is my inheritance. And inheritance, that word, nachala, so important. Because an inheritance speaks to, speaks to the one who provides it. So God is saying, you can know a lot about me by how I handle and deal with this land and this people. He goes on and he says something further. He says, because you, meaning those nations, you have scattered them among the nations, meaning you have scattered the Jewish people among the nations, and look at the end of verse 2. What does he say? And because you have done what with my land? Divided it. Now, I believe this is unfulfilled. I believe that we can expect the land of Israel to, in fact, be divided. And what we're going to see is that that is going to lay the foundation for a great time, again, of Jewish persecution. We see here that they are going to be scattered among the nations and that the land is going to be divided. And because of my people, you cast lots for them. How, what they have done, it says here, for a small boy, and the context is a small Jewish boy, you have given to the harlot, meaning you have paid the harlot with a young Jewish boy. And with a young Jewish girl, you have sold her for wine that, that you might drink. And what it says here is that they are going to see the significance of God's covenant people. He says, also, look at verse, verse 4, also, what are you to me? And notice who he's speaking to. Tyre and Sidon. And all the regions of who? Peleshit. Now, Peleshit is the ancient Hebrew word where the term Philistines come from, and today which is applied to the Palestinians. So it's talking about those to the north of Israel and those to the east of Israel. He says, what are you to me? What's he speaking about? I have no relationship with you because you have not entered into a covenant with me. And he says, I am going to do what? He says, your recompense, that is this. What you have done, it's going to be paid out to you. And if you try to, to pay me, meaning if you try to, to get out of this, he says, he is going to respond. For Look at the end of verse 4. He says, For light and quick I will bring your recompense, what you have done, upon your head. And it's simply what we find back in the book of Genesis. You know, what you do to Israel, you bless Israel, you'll be blessed. You curse Israel, you'll be cursed. It's just a different terminology for that same truth. Verse, verse 5. He said, my silver, my gold, you have taken. Meaning that which is precious to him, those good and desirable things you have taken, and you've done what? You brought them into your sanctuaries. Meaning you have used that which belongs to me for pagan purposes. Verse 6, and the children of Judah... And the children of Jerusalem, you have sold, you have sold to the Yevanim. What is that? Well, it's the ancient word for the Europeans. On account that, on account that you might push them far from their borders. Now, what does this speak about? It speaks about how the enemy of the purposes of God, those who stand in opposition to his will, they know something. They know that if they want to be successful, if the will of God is not going to be brought about, this is what they want to do. 
They want to take the people outside the land. They want to move them away from their border where God has called the people to be. We need to realize this is end times prophecy. And what is at the heart, the land, the Jewish people, and whether they're going to be there or not. And do you see the the conflict? What does God say in verse 1? He's promising to bring the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem where? Back to the land. And what are his enemies wanting to do? Move them far away from their border. There's a battle going on in regard to where these people are going to dwell. And therefore, verse 7, he says, Behold, I am stirring them up from that place where you have sold them there. He says, I'm stirring things up, and I will bring back your recompense. Meaning again, what you have done, I'm going to bring it back upon your head. Because, verse 8, because I will sell your sons based upon what you've done. God, remember the promise. The measure that you measure will be measured out to you. You've sold the children of Judah and Jerusalem into slavery. You've moved them out of their land. So God says, I am going to sell your sons and your daughters into the hands of Judah. And they will sell them to where? Sheba. And to a nation far away. For the Lord God has spoken. Verse 9. Proclaim this among the nations. Sanctify, meaning be ready for what? War. Now, that's why I can be so assured of something. People ask me all the time, what's going to happen in Israel? War. That's what's going to happen. What's going to happen around Israel? War. If not today, tomorrow, if not tomorrow, next week, if not next week, next month, but understand prophetically, there is going to be war. Not just one war, but many wars in the last days. So he says, this is a commandment. We're supposed to do this. Proclaim this among the nations. Get ready for war. And he says, stir up the mighty ones. Let them approach. Let them go up. All the men of war, get ready. See, if we want to be obedient, this is what God says. Look at verse 10. He says, beat your your shovels into swords and your pruning shears into spears. And let the weak, let him say, that I am mighty. Now, what Joel is saying here is very similar to what we see in the prophecy of Zechariah. When Zechariah tells us in that famous 12th chapter that the one who is weak, the one who is is small, the one that has no resources, well, God is going to make this one mighty and strong. Why? Because they do something. Because they rely upon him and they're seeking his will. See, you might be physically weak. You may be without physical resources. But when you are committed to the promises of God, when you speak spiritual truth, you are going to be anointed with power. But make no mistake about it. He's saying that war is coming and be ready. Verse 11. He says, do this, meaning get ready. And come, for all the nations round about, they are going to be gathered there. And the Lord is going to bring down their mighty ones. Meaning, he is going to position them to be brought down. That is, to be defeated. Verse 12. He says here, verse 12. He says, wake up. Go up among the nations. To where? To Amic Yehoshaphat, the valley of this place of God's judgment. For, for there I will return for judgment. Of who? All the nations round about. So realize, biblically, God is going to bring all these nations to that valley. 
The valley that we call from a New Testament perspective Armageddon. From the Old Testament prophecy, we call it Jezreel. And here, we call it the valley of the Lord's judgment. And he's going to do so to who? All the nations. And that's why if you're wise, you are going to identify with Israel. You know, it's so controversial today, that nation. The reason why? Because the world is in darkness. It does not step into the light, but rather it lives in darkness and deceit. God's going to do what? He is going to cause light to shine in the darkness, and that light's going to begin from the land of Israel. We saw that with his first coming in Galilee, and he's going to do it in his second coming in that same place, in the Jezreel Valley, at Armageddon. Do you know something? When you are, are looking from Megiddo, that is the ancient term for Armageddon, when you're looking out of the Jezreel Valley, and you see that place which is a, a battlefield, by, by nature, a perfect place for a great conflict. When you look across that from Megiddo, you know what you see to your left? You see the city of Nazareth. And just think about this. Messiah, as he grew up, knowing all things, he would grow up and look out from Nazareth and see the place that he was going to return to in order to defeat the enemy and bring about the establishment of the kingdom of God. So he says, again, in the verse 12, for there I will return, or I will dwell, or sit. The word for returning and the word for sitting are very similar. So I will sit there in order to judge. Judge all the nations round about. Look at verse 13. Now, in verse 13, this is what John and the book of Revelation chose so often in the book of Revelation, and you guys are studying that, correct? So many times when you look at prophecy in the book of Revelation, you'll find that, that John took Old Testament prophecy. And this is exactly what he did with this section of Scripture. You look sometime at the last half of Revelation chapter 19. What happens in Revelation 19? The second coming. And you are going to see that Messiah is coming. He has that sickle in his hand that he is going to reap. And he is going to come and he is going to bring judgment as he treads upon the grapes of wrath in the winepress. And that's exactly what we see here. Look at verse 13. It says, send forth that sickle for ripe is the harvest. Let them come down and let the fullness of this wine vat, let the wineries overflow for abundance is their wrath. Meaning this, that God looks at the evilness and the time is at hand. That's what he means when it says ripe is the harvest. The time is at hand to judge this wickedness because great is their evil. Verse 14. And he says, Hamonim, Hamonim. What's that? Hamon means a great multiple. Now, in the Hebrew, we have it in the plural. So it's not just great multitude. That's sufficient. See, good Hebrew, we would not put that in the plural. It's redundant. But the Hebrew to emphasize is this. It says, Hamonim, so great multitudes, and they just don't say it once. They say it twice. Hamonim, Hamonim, great multitudes, and great multitudes will be where? Well, there's a change. We would expect it to say, Emek Yehoshaphat, in the valley where God is going to judge. But we don't find that. We find Emek He Harutz. Now, that word Harutz, well, we see it in a different form of that same word where? In the book of Daniel chapter 9. At that prophecy dealing with the end of Daniel's 70th week. Where it says destruction has been determined. So this word that's mentioned here is really the word for having been determined. 
that which has been, been chiseled out, set in stone. And what God is saying is this. He says, there's going to be great multitudes, great multitudes in this valley where it's been already determined. For close or near is the day of the Lord. Where? In this valley where it's been determined. And then look at verse 15. We go back to something that we come, came across earlier in chapter 2 and verse 10. Look there, chapter 2, verse 10. It says, before him, this is his mighty army that's coming. Before him, the earth trembles. Now, this is a different word. It means to shake in fear. Before him, the earth trembles. And the heavens, they, they shake. And then notice something else. The sun and the moon, what happens to them? They become dark. Now, that's in contrast to what we saw at the end of chapter 2. There's two different events, and it's very important that we understand that. When we're dealing with our blessed hope, what's another word for our blessed hope? Rapture. When we are expecting that, there are prophetic signs. Two of those signs is this, what we've already saw, that the sun is going to become dark and the moon is going to become red like what? Blood. That announces our blessed hope. We should expect when that happens, two things. For believers to be taken, those who are dead in Messiah, their bodies now, to be dead and a believer. To be dead and a believer means to be present with the Lord. But, but the body that, that remains of this physical body is buried, it decays, it turns to dust. But at the time of our blessed hope, those of us who are still alive, our bodies are going to be transformed. Those who have already perished in the faith, they are going to see what's left over. No matter where they've been buried, no matter if they're scattered about, God's able to do something. With God, the scripture says all things are possible. And he is going to bring back those remnants into something that's glorious. And in the clouds, we are going to be reunited with a new body and our souls. That's the time of the blessed hope. And what announces that before the wrath of God falls, what announces that is the sun turning dark, all those other events that we spoke of concerning the stars and such. But the key sign is the moon becoming red like blood. Not because of some eclipse. Not because how it may look here or there. But God is going to do a great event. He is going to cause the world, no matter where one is, to see this, this red moon. That is the sign of the blessed hope. That's not what we're talking about here. That's not what we spoke about in chapter 2, verse 10. Look at verse 15. We read here, the sun and the moon, both, not just one, but both are going to become dark. And the stars, they are going to be gathered up with their light. So we see at the time of Messiah's second coming, what is going to be taking place in the sky? It's going to be utter what? Darkness. Darkness is going to fall over the earth. And that's significant. Why? Well, let me give you a scripture. Exodus chapter 12, verse 29. A very key passage. When you understand this, you can understand a lot of other verses as well. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 29, it is Passover night. Not the eve of Passover, but it's Passover night. It is the, the beginning of the 15th day. And at midnight, what happens? That angel of death called the Mashchit. That angel of death goes forth and visits every home in Egypt. Now, a few years ago, not too far from here in Orlando, we studied about Messiah's Passover at one of our conferences. And in Matthew 26, verse 1, it mentions Passover. And what should come into our mind when we hear Passover? Well, a couple different things. We talked about earlier, redemption, 
Passover, the festival of redemption. But there's another thing that should come into our mind, and that is death. And if you are a good student of the book of Exodus, let me ask you, what homes in Egypt did death come into those homes? What homes? What's the answer? All of them, right? All of them. Now, there was two forms of death. See, most of the time we think of death as what? That, that plague, that angel of death that slew who? The firstborn. But there was another death that visited, and that is the death of the lamb. Now, here's the message. Passover comes, and what should come into our mind is death. Every home, no exceptions, home of the Hebrews, home of the Egyptians, home of other peoples and nations that were living in Egypt, made no difference. Every home, death comes on Passover. The question is, what type of death? And whose death? Is it going to be a death that brings about a great cry and despair? That of the death of the firstborn? Or you can escape that death by choosing the death of the Passover lamb. No, if you chose that death, the death of the Passover lamb, and appropriated that blood properly, then that death of destruction would pass over. But for those who didn't, that destructive death came at midnight. It says, Bachetzi Lila, in the middle of the night. Now, in the middle of the night, what can we expect? Darkness. But if you read the scriptures carefully, it says, but in Goshen, in the home of the Israelites, they had, what's the answer? Light. They had light. Now, what type of light did they have? They had, according to the Midrashic interpretations, and that's not scriptural, but there's a biblical basis for it. They had a messianic light. You know what we call that in Hebrew? Or Hamashiach, the light of Messiah. Now, they had a foretaste of that. Why? Well, the basis for that is what we talked about last night briefly when we mentioned Kafar Nechum, that is Capernaum. Remember that prophecy from Isaiah where it says, the light is going to shine where? In the darkness. And why is that the case? Look again at verse 15. At the time of Messiah's second coming, we see that same thing in Matthew 24, Verses uh, 29 and 30, it says, at that time, there's going to be darkness. And who's going to come? The light of the world. So in that same way, look at verse 15. It says, the moon and the sun are going to become dark. And all the stars, their light is going to be gathered up. It's going to be totally dark. And what's going to happen? The light of the world is going to come. He is going to be manifested. And how are we going to see him? Not us. Because you know what we're going to be doing as believers? We're going to be coming with him. We're going to be on white horses following after our Lord and Savior. But those of Israel and those of the nations, what are they going to see? Look at verse 16. And the Lord from Zion is going to do what? What does your Bible say? He will roar. Now, the rabbis get this right. Even though it says, and the Lord, yud heh vav heh, they say it's not really the Lord, but who's going to roar? The Lion of Judah. They understand that this is speaking of a messianic prophecy. So the Lord, i.e. Messiah, the Son of God, He's the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. The Lord out of Zion is going to roar. And from Jerusalem, he will give his voice. And at the voice of Messiah, it says, the heavens and the earth, they are going to, to quake. And the Lord, he will be a shelter for his people. And a stronghold for who? The children of Israel. Now, some people will look at this and say, you know, that's kind of uh, offensive. You mean he's coming back, and when he comes back, that last, that second coming, he's only coming for the children of Israel? Read the book of Romans. There's a time of the Gentiles, but that time comes to 
an end. And God moves his attention back to the lost sheep of Israel. But even at that late time, it doesn't mean that there's no hope for the Gentiles. No, what do we know about Egypt? You see, this first Passover, that first exodus from Egypt, that first example of redemption teaches us so much about the future. Because what happens is this, why God did 10 plagues? Let me ask you a question. Would God have been able to bring the children of Israel out after one plague? Yes. He could have done it with no plagues. All things are possible. So the fact that God used 10 the number of completion. Why 10 plagues? Here's the answer. If you look, you'll see a change among the Egyptians. They began and they said to, Mo, to, said to Pharaoh, you know, th this isn't magic. This isn't the sorcery that we know. This is none other but what? The finger of God. And they began to speak to Pharaoh saying, why are you destroying the people? Why are you bringing destruction on the nation? Agree with God. Send forth the children out of here. Lest we be destroyed. And those ten plagues, this is what happened. More and more of the Egyptians. More and more of other people who were living in Egypt. When they experienced those plagues, they said, you know what? We're looking at Goshen. Things look pretty good there. Thing, things aren't happening there. Why? This was the inheritance that Pharaoh gave to the Hebrews, to Jacob and his sons. You ever ask yourself? See, names are important. Are they not in the Bible? You read Moses means to be drawn up. We find the name Jacob means one who pursues after and will be rewarded. We see all these names have meaning. What's the name Goshen? I mean, it's important. We all have heard of that. So why don't we take the time and look, you know, today we're living in marvelous times. There are resources. All you have to do is put your course cursor. All you have to do is move your thumb, whatever, and just click and you get an answer. Don't be lazy students of the Bible. Realize every word has revelation. You know what the term Goshen means? It means, comes from the Hebrew word, legeshe, which means to approach. See, that was the place where you could approach God. And what we find is, if you read the scripture carefully, you read some of the commentaries, they get it right. When the people of Egypt, not the Hebrews, but the Gentiles, when they saw that in Goshen, <laughs> these plagues weren't affecting, what do you think they did? Some of them did what? Went to Goshen. You don't have to be a rocket scientist, right? This, this isn't hard. You see, here, the plagues, there's not. Just, just that simple. And there was a great number, a mixed multitude that kept the Passover because they wanted to approach God. They wanted to be with God. And in the same way, God's going to do the same thing in the last days in order that those that identify themselves with the covenant people, like Ruth that said, your people, my people, your God, my God. When someone says that, it doesn't matter what their background is. When they say that, God invites them into a covenantal relationship. So we look here and we find that there's going to be darkness, but that light, Messiah is coming. He is going to shout like a lion. He is going to lift up his voice. The heavens and the earth are going to quake. And the Lord, it says he will be shelter for his people. He will be a stronghold for the children of Israel. You know, verse, so much of this, but this verse, verse 16, it's set up as poetry. What's poetry? One thing is parallel to another. We look here and we find that, that we have shelter and stronghold. Would you not agree that they're similar? And therefore we have as well, we have his people. What's parallel to his people in that verse? What's parallel to that? The sons of Israel. So it teaches us. 
It teaches us that his people are the children of Israel. Verse 17. And that you shall know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion and my holy mountain. And there shall be in Jerusalem holiness. And no longer will any, what does your Bible say? Now, your Bible says foreigners. It's the word zarim. More often than not, it comes from the word zar, which means strain or foreign or, or different. But it's not talking about foreigners. It's talking about foreign gods. What he's saying is this. In my holy mountain, in the place of worship, there's going to be no other gods. There's going to be no other deities, no other worship other than the Lord God of Israel. Verse 18. And it shall come about, like this expression, Be'yom ha'hu, on that day. Whenever we see that, Be'yom ha'hu, that day, we're speaking about judgment. That phrase alone, if we haven't figured it out already, it's a last days, a day of judgment term. And it will come about on that day. Now, we hear a day of judgment, and we think of, oh, my, my. But judgment is condemnation, but judgment is also vindication. There will be those that are condemned and those that are vindicated. And notice what God's going to do. It's the God of restoration. Now, this is the word that's coming up. We talked about it, a cease. A cease is good, new wine. Do you realize that, that not always is the older the wine, the better? It depends. Certain types of wine, it is ready to be drinking of immediately. And this is what this is referring to. And God is saying something. It's the new wine, the good new wine. And he says, on that day. Now remember, earlier on in our study of Joel, what does he do about this new wine? He cuts it off. He judges it. Now, what is wine? Do you remember? What did I say wine was symbolic to biblically? Anyone remember? Last night we talked about it. Joy. Happiness. And that was all cut off. But now, notice what God says. He promises. He says, and the mountains are going to drip this wine. Meaning, mountains, what should come into your mind with mountains? Worship. High places, but not high places of idolatry. But going up, going up in order to worship God. He says, the mountains are going to drip this new wine. And upon the hills will go forth, what? Chalav, what's that? Milk. So he's going to do two things. Wine and milk. Joy and sustenance. That's what God's going to give to us. When he sustains us, we are made joyful. That's not what it says. It says when we are joyful, we are going to find sustenance. The order is so important. That's why it says in the book of Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is what? My strength. So if you feel powerless in this world, if you feel like you're being overcome, if you feel helpless and weak, unable to do the things that you think God would have you to do, you know what the problem is? You don't have enough joy. You need to start worshiping God. Be grateful. Praise Him. And God will give you His power. So he says, on that day, the mountains, they are going to drip this new wine, and upon the hills are going to go forth his, his chalav, milk. And in all the channels, this is streams or brooks, afike Yehuda, and all the rivers of Judah will go forth water. What's water synonymous with? Blessing. And there will be a spring of of water where it says and the spring will be from the mountain or the house excuse me the temple of the Lord it will go forth and it will give water to the to the river of what what does it say which river Shittim in in Hebrew how do we say that in English Acacia 
Now, acacia wood. What is significant about that? The Ark of the Covenant was made from what? Acacia wood overlaid with gold. But this is a clear reference to the Ark. What's in the Ark? The tablets. And what is contained within the commandments? Well, the commandments are life and death, but we don't want the death. They are blessing and cursing. We don't want the curse. See, God took the death and the curse in order that we might have life and the blessing. We are going to receive the outcome of the power of that Ark of the Covenant, which is life and blessing. And then it says, look at verse 19. Now, realize, this is all within the context of redemption. What's the festival of redemption? What festival? Passover. Passover took place where? Egypt. And notice what he says. Verse 19. Egypt will be a place of what? Desolation. And Edom. Now, we've gone through all of these, these verses. Said nothing about Edom. We've had Peleshit. We had Tyre and Sidon, Lebanon. But here, at the very end, we deal with Edom. And Edom is significant. Edom takes its most significant place, not in the past, but in the future. Because when Messiah returns, one of the first places he's going, we know where he's going at the end. Where's that? Mount of Olives. He's going to come down that, that mountain, cross over the Kidron Valley, enter through the Eastern Gate, go into the Holy of Holies, and begin his kingdom. So we know when Messiah returns, the last place he's going is where? Jerusalem. Mount of Olives, then Jerusalem. We also know some else he's going. Where is that? Well, he's going to the valley of what? Jehoshaphat. The Jezreel Valley, what we also call where? Armageddon. So we know two of the places that Messiah is going. He's going to the Mount of Olives. He's going to, to Megiddo, to Armageddon, to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Where else does he go? Well, read sometime Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63 says that he is going to bring judgment upon Mount Sair in Botsra, which is a place related to who? Edom. So one place that he's going is Edom for judgment. And it says that Edom, now Edom is connected to who? Esau. The people of Esau became Edom. And what was Esau uninterested in? He looks at this, this birthright. He says, what is this birthright to me? Meaning, what good is it for me? And he's right. It's not for you. That birthright is to be a blessing to who? Others. And Esau was not interested in being a blessing to others. Yaakov was, Jacob is. And we see here, look again, he says, Egypt will be a desolation. And Edom will become a desolate wilderness. Why? Because of, what does your Bible say? Violence. Would you be interested to know what the Hebrew word is? It is Hamas. It says, because of violence. Now, we've talked about this before. See, there's two words, right? In Hebrew for violence. One is alimut. Alimut is violence, but with a purpose. That doesn't mean it justifies it, but I'm violent because I want something. I look, for example, at uh, uh, Bunny's purse. So, oh, I, I want that purse. So if she would give it to me, that would be fine. But if she doesn't want to give it to me, I'm going to struggle. I'm going to be violent because I have a purpose. I want that purse. That's alimut. Hamas is something totally different. Hamas is violence for the sake of what? Violence. The motivation is seeing someone else suffer. Seeing someone else in pain. That delights Satan. And Hamas is always a satanic violence. Violence for the sake of rejoicing over the misery and the suffering of others. And that's what it says here concerning Egypt and Edom. 
because of the violence that they did to the children of Judah, who they spilled or shed innocent blood, where? In the land. So understand, this is a last day prophecy. And we see the descendants of Edom, who are the modern day Palestinians. They are shedding blood in the land. Look now to verse 20. But it says here, in light of all their desire to bring violence and destruction to the covenant people. What does God promise? It says, but, and notice, in contrast to, but Judah forever will dwell, and Jerusalem from generation to everlasting. It says, for I will do something. Last verse, verse 21. Now, verse 21 gives, well, it's very similar to what we see in the book of Exodus. Remember when, when Moses says, God, let me see your face, right? And God says, well, you can't see my face, but I'll tell you what you can't see, my back. And he places, he takes Moses, and he puts Moses upon the rock. Now, some see this as messianic related because the rock of our salvation is Messiah. He places Moses upon that rock. He covers his eyes. He passes through, and he sees the back of God. And we find that there's a proclamation. And it talks about how the Lord, that he is merciful, that he is kind, that he's long-suffering, that he's forgiving. But we also see the same expression. Look at it again, and we'll close. Verse 21. So significant that this prophecy ends with these words. He says, I will cleanse them of their blood. Now, blood in this sense is blood guiltiness. It is a blood of shame, a blood of impurity. And God says two things. He says, I will clean, but he says, I will not clean. Who is this? The Lord who dwells in Zion. See, he gives two options. He will either clean or he will not clean. Now, what's he talking about? And why does he end this prophecy in this way? Well, one of the reasons why I chose to share at this time the prophecy of Yoel. If you were to ask me what is one of the primary themes, maybe the main theme in this prophecy of Joel, you know what I would say? Redemption. Redemption. Redemption's related to, we learn about it from Passover. And God gave all the people both Jew and Gentile in Egypt, through many chances and opportunities through these 10 plagues and through other signs, he gave all the people an opportunity to either be cleansed and forgiven or not to be cleansed and forgiven. It had to do with one thing, and what was that? Whether they would keep the Passover or not. Whether they would seek redemption or not. And this is how Joe's prophecy ends. Do you want to be cleansed? Choose redemption. You don't want to be cleansed? Reject redemption. It's just that simple. God is a redeemer. Messiah is the redeemer. So you want redemption? You choose the Lamb of God. You don't want redemption? Redemption? You reject the Lamb of God. It comes down to a choice. And my hope and my prayer is this that the people that come in contact with, with our work, with, with the teaching that we provide, that they will be put in a position where they can make an informed decision. What they do, it's up to them. We can plead, we can pray, we can do all that we can, but it comes down to a personal decision. Have you made that wise choice? Have you accepted redemption in that blood of the Lamb? It's very simple. Didn't matter who was in that home. If that home had dealt properly with the blood of the Lamb, judgment passed over. If not, judgment brought death. It's just that simple. 
I'll close with this. Today, every week, we do a radio show that's, that's aired in San Diego. And today, as we ended up that show that we recorded, we were talking about the plan of salvation. And one of the people who hosts the, the, the do the interview with me, he says, you know, it's just so simple, isn't it? I mean, God made it so simple. And as I was listening, I thought to myself, it was almost like a, a disappointment in his voice. You know, my thought was this, and, and someone who has, has really commented on this so effectively and truthfully is Charles Stanley. Charles Stanley, when someone was asking him about the plan of salvation being so simple, even that a small child can, can understand it and make that decision, you know what he says? Why would God want to make it hard? His desire is for us to receive salvation. His desire is for us to repent and turn to him and find life. He finds no pleasure in the destruction of individuals eternally. So he made it so simple. Will you make the right and simple decision? Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.